Paul de Lacey had been one of my oldest friends. Three months ago, he'd been killed in a cave-in. I was out of the country. This was the first time since his death I'd been able to visit the cemetery and pay my respects. I wondered if Paul's hobby had been worth the price of his life. During the past 20 years, Paul had become world famous as an amateur archaeologist. In fact, everything he touched became successful. He and Ed Phillips built the De Lacey Phillips Motor Company into a multi-million dollar business. I thought of his son, Steve, and his daughter, Pamela. I'd known them since they were children. When their mother died, Paul and his children seemed to grow even closer together. I knew their father's death must have affected them both deeply. I decided to visit them. See you again. Thanks. When did you arrive? Late last night. It always amazes me how you're just arriving or just leaving. Sit down. Thanks. Can I get you something? No, nothing, thanks. Where's Pam? You might as well know she isn't living here. She's taken an apartment in the city. Do you want to tell me about it? Not much to tell. It concerns Dad. I don't think Dad's death was an accident. How does that tie in with your sister? I think family killed him. That's a very serious accusation. I know, but I think she did. Call it instinct, anything you like. I don't want to call it. I want to know. When your father was killed in Mexico, you and Pam were along. From the newspaper accounts I read, the police believed there was an accident. So did I, at the time. What happened to change your mind? Well... Immediately after Dad's death, Pam began avoiding me. It became increasingly worse at the funeral. She didn't say two words to me. And when Dad's will was read, she didn't even show up. We've always been so close. So I began to think. Suddenly I got an idea. Pam had killed him and her conscience was driving her crazy. Is that what you told Pam? Yes. And she didn't deny it. She had hysterics. That night, she gave me all the proof I needed. She moved out of the house. She ran away. You said you had an apartment. Where? Carlton Terrace. Where are you going? I'm going to find out if you're right. taxi driver to take me to the Carlton Terrace apartments. And as we drove, I kept thinking about what Steve had told me. I've wanted a lot of things in my lifetime. Right now, I wanted Steve to be wrong. Is this the Lazian? I'm Michael Lanyon. I've always thought it was Dad's best picture. <laughs> oh, Pam. It's wonderful seeing you again. How did you find me? Steve gave me your address. Oh. I guess it's only sisterly to ask. How is he? Much like you. When I asked him about you, he was very uncomfortable. I guess I'm not a very good poker player. I didn't come here to play games, Pam. I came because of a conversation I had with Steve. I hope that's not the only reason, Mike, because I'm very fond of you. If I'd known where to reach you after Dad's death, I, I honestly think I would have come running. You used to run to Steve when you had a problem. What happened to change that? Did, did Steve tell you he accused me of killing... Why don't you tell me about it? I want to tell you about it. Dad, Steve, and I were together at the ruins. 
Dad was excited because he believed within a few days he would uncover a tomb older than the pharaohs. Go on. Steve asked Dad whether he'd considered their conversation. Dad said he had, and his decision was that Steve would go into no other business but the DeLacy Phillips Motor Company. Steve was furious, and he argued all the way back to camp. What happened then? Steve left the next morning for the village. Then Ed Phillips arrived. He and Dad sent all the workers away, and together they began reinforcing the cave. Two days later, Steve came back. I told him not to worry, that Dad would come around. Steve said he wasn't going to worry, that everything would work out. Huh. What did Steve want to do? I don't know. The next day, Dad went into the cave alone. That's when it happened. It wasn't an accident. How do you know? Fifteen hours of digging before we found him. I'll never forget it. I was the first one to reach him. He was dead. Then I saw something else. But I was so stunned, it, it took days before it penetrated my mind. What did you see? Two of the wooden braces holding up the structure to the entrance had been sawed through. The slightest chip to land and the braces had to collapse. When we returned here, I, I went to some friends. I didn't tell them why, but I told them what I'd seen. They told me it was called splice saw and used effectively in the last war as a booby trap. And that only an engineer could rig the proper cutting. Then I realized Dad had been murdered. What can you do about it, Mike? Well, the first thing is to straighten Steve out and get you back home where you belong. I don't want that. Why? When I ran away, I... I promised myself no one would ever learn what I knew. But now, I want the man punished. I think you will soon know what Steve meant when he told me not to worry that everything was going to work out. You think he's involved? More than that. Steve is a graduate engineer. Pam said Steve and his father had argued. If anyone could tell me whether the argument had been really serious, it would be Ed Phillips, Paul's partner for 30 years. We gave the driver the address of the DeLacy Phillips building. Come in. Oh, Mike. Mike, when did you get in? A short while ago. Good to see you. Good to see you. Mike, have you seen Pam and Steve? Yeah. No, well, Mike, you, you don't usually ask a lot of questions unless you have a pretty good reason. Something bothering you? I can't quite put my finger on it, Ed. But I'm not sure Paul's death was an accident. It doesn't add up. He wouldn't overlook a weak wooden brace. I might make that mistake, but how do you explain Paul making it? I don't, I don't know. I, I just accepted Paul's death as an accident. Well, now, now, there'll always be a doubt in my mind. Oh, Mike, I wish you hadn't have said that. Well, maybe I've been hanging around the wrong people too long. <laughs> Come on, I'll buy you a lunch. No, thanks. I... Just taking my appetite away. I'm sorry, Ed. I'm sorry too, Mike. of Alan Harper, Paul's attorney. He knew I was on my way over. Come in, Lanyard. Thanks. I'm sorry taking up your time like this. You said it was important. Yeah. Could be. Well, please sit down. Thanks. Harper. How much money did Paul to Lacey leave to Steve and Pamela? Well, even for you, that's an irregular question. But the will's been filed for probate. It's now a matter of court record. I figured you could save me a trip downtown. Paul to Lacey left over $5 million after taxes. $1 million he left to several charities. The remainder he divided equally between Pamela and Stephen. Had he ever discussed changing his will? The only changes Paul ever made were due to his increasing fortune. 
Occasionally, we altered the amounts of the various trust funds that he had set up for his children. Did he ever say he was disappointed in either of his children? Absolutely not. His children were devoted to him, and he to them. I assume you and the insurance companies carefully checked and were satisfied his death was accidental. A thorough investigation was held, yes, we were satisfied. Did you or anyone else check the braces at the entrance to the cave? I can't say. Why not? You must realize that when a man of Paul de Lacy's stature is accidentally killed, there's confusion. We made arrangements for the funeral and a few days later started our investigation. Then very likely you didn't examine the braces that caused the cave-in. I don't remember. But why is it so important to you? I might have a surprise for you. I might prove that Paul de Lacy was murdered. to review everything that I'd learned today. I thought over all that Steve had said. The fact that Pam suspected him of killing their father could explain her reason for avoiding him. Pam was an intelligent girl. She recognized something and described it well enough to be told it was splice sawing. But it had to be rigged by an engineer. And Steve was an engineer. I remembered Ed's words. I issued orders that nothing in his office was to be touched. Just kept clean. I realized it sounds silly, but Every morning I open his door and say, good morning, Paul. It makes me feel that he isn't far away. Alan Harper had said in the confusion of Paul's death, the investigation was delayed several days. If someone had realized this, it gave him or her time to get rid of damaging evidence. I had to start somewhere, and a long-distance call seemed like a good beginning. Long distance. Long distance. I want to speak to Captain Harold Thompson of the Boston Police Department. No, I don't know his precinct number. Sorry, sir, the circuits are busy. Shall I try again in half an hour? Yes, please. This is Michael Lanyard, room 514, Ambassador Hotel. Thanks. It was only 4.30 in the afternoon. That meant Alan Harper would still be in his office. I decided to call him because I had an idea. Get me Alan Harper. He's an attorney. His office is on Park Lane. Yeah. Harper's secretary put me through to him. He didn't sound at all happy to hear from me. He said I upset him when I implied that Paul's death might not have been an accident. I told him I was sorry and that I needed all of Paul's private papers and files. He said it was impossible and unethical. I told him I didn't have time to argue. and If he didn't send them over right away, I'd call the insurance companies. He was silent for a moment, and then he agreed to have the files delivered to me. I made it clear to him that I wanted everything, the insurance policies, pending patents, corporation setups, and anything else he had. Harper didn't say goodbye. He just said okay and hung up. I talked to Captain Thompson and told him what I wanted him to do. He said he'd get on it right away, and if he found anything, he'd call me back. Paul's files showed him to be a man with dreams and vision. I'd learned what he felt the day he and Ed Phillips started in business, and how he felt when his children were born, and when his wife died. And I learned something else. Hello? We have a collect call from Mr. Harold Thompson. Thompson began by saying he'd put several of his men to work, and he'd only been able to turn up two things. He mentioned MIT in the year 1916, World War I and the Engineers Corps. Then he said even if he had more time, he doubted that anything else could be found. I told him that was enough, because with his information, plus what I'd read in Paul's files, I was beginning to get a pretty clear picture. Thompson has supplied me with what might be the key to Paul's death. Right now I was tired and needed some sleep, because by this time tomorrow, I would either have proved Paul was murdered, or I would know for certain his death had been accidental. Next morning, while having breakfast, I telephoned Steve and Pamela. I asked them to meet me at my hotel about 10 o'clock. I also called Ed Phillips and invited him to stop by around 10.15. I had an idea, but I wasn't at all sure it would work. Did 
Did I disturb your breakfast? Oh, not at all. You're right on time. Mike, you sounded so urgent this morning. Have you... Have I found out something about Steve? Yeah. Yesterday, Mike, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have talked to you about my brother. I don't want anything to happen to him. Sit down, Pam. Steve will be here any minute. We'll get everything straightened out then. Oh, but I don't want to see him. I think it's a little late to prevent it. Hello, Mike. Steve. If this is a joke, I don't like it. It's no joke, Steve. I want you and Pam to listen to what I have to say. Go ahead. Sit down. Steve. You told me that you thought your sister was responsible for your father's death. You want the truth? No. And you don't think she did it? Let's get it over with. You said you had something to say. Mr. Phillips is on his way up to your suite, Mr. Lanyard. Thanks. What's going on, Mike? In a few minutes, I'll know whether your father's death was an accident. Come in. Well, Steve. Hello, Ed. Oh, Pam, it's good to see you both. You know, I've been intending to call you for dinner. How about tomorrow night? That'll be fine. Oh, Mike, I'm sorry for the way I acted yesterday. Now, uh, what's this all about? Ed, you lied to me yesterday, twice. I'm afraid I don't follow you. You said you believed Paul's death was accidental. You said you weren't an engineer. All right. I'll still say it. It won't work anymore, Ed. You see, I've been checking. You were graduated from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1916. In the First World War, you served as an engineer. What about it? Well, what has this to do with Paul? I did a lot of reading last night. Mike, don't fool with me. If you have anything to say, say it to my attorney. Better still, why don't you call the police? I'm sorry, Pam. I want to apologize for it. You're not leaving, Ed. Sit down. You told me that 30 years ago you and Paul formed a corporation. But you neglected to tell me that the stock in that corporation had a reversion clause. If one of you died, the stock reverted to the surviving partner. That's common knowledge, Mike. Perhaps. But 15 years ago you and Paul decided to change that. But you never did. And I know why. Suppose you tell me. Hmm? Paul married first and had two children. You married much later and had a son. Then you and Paul began to discuss the stock clause because you both had heirs. And as you said, you'd built a dynasty. Then your wife and son were killed in an automobile accident. Shall I go on? No. You might get it wrong, Mike. When my wife and son died, a part of me died, too. Over the years, the loneliness grew instead of lessening. There was nothing left for me but my work. Mike, you know, I, I used to go home at night and I'd count the hours till I could get back and get started again. Do you know why I tampered with that brace? Why I had to kill Paul? One day, Paul talked about bringing Steve into the firm. I, I tried to talk him out of it. You remember that, don't you, Steve? Paul brought up the stock provision clause again, and I realized that he wanted everything for his children. Mike, I, I haven't very long to live. I'm a sick man. I don't have a son to leave my share to. 
Everything that I'd spent a lifetime to build was going to go to Paul and his family. Mike, I didn't want to be cheated, don't you understand? I, I wanted to own it. For once in my life, I, I wanted something that was all mine before I died. None of you understand. Just what Paul does. I loved him. You want me to call the district attorney? No. I may as well do that. I've done everything else. Operator, would you give me the district attorney, please? I thought you left town without saying goodbye to us. Uh, you know me better than that. Goodbye, Pam. Steve. Goodbye, Mike, and thanks. Bye. Mike, we, we visited Ed today at the penitentiary hospital. The doctor told us he won't live another 30 days. Uh, Pam and I talked it over. The firm's name will remain the DeLacy Phillips Motor Company. We told that to Ed today. What did he say? He asked Steve if he would issue orders that nothing in his office be touched or changed, that it always remain as it is. What are you going to do? It'll be the first request I make the day I start. I didn't say it to them, but I knew Paul had to be very proud of his two children. And I knew something else. Steve was going to do a good job. <laughs>